Earlier this year, a hacker was able to compromise Microsoft's new AI-infused healthcare chatbot called Azure HealthBot. Think ChatGPT, but for healthcare. This was immediately reported to Microsoft, quickly becoming one of the highest paid bug bounties in history due to its severity. I've made a lot of videos breaking down some of the most sophisticated cyber attacks to date. However, this one stands alone. The sheer simplicity of this exploit sets it apart, making you wonder how something so mind-numbingly simple could compromise a service handling the confidential and sensitive medical records of tens of millions of people worldwide. As the bot would integrate with remote data sources, this exploit made it possible for attackers to access all of the third-party data that the bot had access to, including patient databases, appointment calendars, authentication credentials, and more. What's shocking is that the bug hunter hacked Azure HealthBot twice, in two different, independent ways. What's really bizarre is that after Microsoft issued patches, they were able to exploit it a third time, and after another patch was issued, they were able to exploit it a fourth time, all functioning as standalone exploits working independently from one another. In this video, we're going to be breaking down how each of these four exploits function under the hood. The first vulnerability allows an attacker to trick the backend server hosting the chatbot into leaking authentication credentials and related information belonging to users on the platform. The remaining vulnerabilities are three different ways to escape the Node.js sandbox on the backend, taking complete control of the server itself, allowing the execution of arbitrary code. The implications of this are devastating, as the server is shared across multiple different users known as tenants and has access to all of these tenants' data. These exploits actually get progressively simpler over the course of the video, so if you get lost, be sure to stick around until the end to see where things get really bizarre. Let's begin by taking a look at the first exploit. Let's start with the fact that Azure HealthBot has a feature to be connected to remote data sources. These integrations are known as data connections. Whenever a data connection is added, the front end will send out a request to the back end in order to retrieve the data connection details and authentication information. Once received, the server will respond with the requested information. Let's take a look in more detail what one of these requests look like. There are two important things to note in this URL. This field is a unique HealthBot instance ID that is different for each user. It's not a secret, but rather a directly observable value that will be used for all requests sent to our specific HealthBot instance. In addition to this, the last number in the URL is the ID of the specific data connection we're adding. Each data connection has a unique ID associated with it. Once the server receives this request, it will do some processing behind the scenes, and then responds to the client with a JSON in this format. If you're familiar with Azure, you might have noticed that this is an Azure Table API response. If you're not, don't worry about it, as there's no need to focus on the details here, but this does give us a vital clue. This means that the server is storing the connection data in an Azure Table storage service, which is where it pulls the underlying data from. Just to recap, this means that we now know that the server is querying an Azure table behind the scenes to get the data that was requested. Given this, the bug hunter's intuition was to start playing around with the data connection ID, as this identifies an instance of a data connection. If the data connections for multiple users are all stored in the same table, and were somehow able to query for an arbitrary data connection ID, we would be able to access data connections of other users. Of course, we know what the client's request to the server looks like, as it is directly observable on the client. However, we cannot directly observe what the server's query to the Azure table looks like. In order to try and piece together exactly what the server is doing behind the scenes, the bug hunter took a look at the Azure Table API documentation. A generic query to retrieve data from an Azure table looks like this. Let's continue trying to reverse engineer what the server is doing behind the scenes. There are four values here that we must fill in. Conveniently, we don't need to look very far, as the server's response to the client discloses a lot of this. Let's sub in the values for my account, partition key, and row key with the values returned to us from the server. Lastly, with a little bit of guesswork and testing, we make the assumption that the table name is the HealthBot instance ID. At this point, we have a pretty good guess that this is the URL that the server is using to get the information behind the scenes. 
the interesting thing here is that the value being used for the row key in the server's query is the data connection ID that was originally supplied in the request from the client. This means that a value in our control is directly placed into the Azure table query. Of course, it won't be as easy as just entering an arbitrary ID in hopes that it belongs to another user, as the backend would easily deny the request. Let's take a look at how we can break this. Since our input is appended to a URL, the idea here is to leverage path traversal to cancel out the prepended information added by the server, and then add our own information afterward. Recall that the sequence dot dot slash can be used to move up a level within a directory. The way Azure treats this can be used to our advantage. Let's begin crafting our malicious URL. Rather than keeping our own data connection ID, let's go ahead and replace this with an encoded slash character, followed by two dots, followed by another encoded slash. When Azure goes to interpret this, it will actually end up ignoring all of the trailing characters a part of the path, effectively removing them. After this, we can go ahead and specify our own Azure query. We can place arbitrary values into the table name fields belonging to other tenants. We can also place arbitrary data connection IDs into the row key fields belonging to the data connections of other tenants as well. This way, with some trial and error, we can actually get our hands on the data from other tenants within the Azure table. Notably, we need to leave out the final quote, as the server-side URL that this is getting placed into still has its own trailing quote, and we don't want to invalidate the query. All we need to do now is send off this attacker-crafted request, and the server will successfully return the data connection details and authentication information of other users. If you think that tricking the server into leaking information is bad, now we're going to turn to the remaining three exploits, each of which are different ways to escape the Node.js sandbox on the backend, taking control of the server itself. The intent is to be able to execute shell commands in order to try and find a way to access data from other tenants. It turns out that Azure HealthBot has a feature that lets you execute your own JavaScript code in an isolated, sandboxed environment on their own backend. The bug hunter began to do a little reconnaissance within this sandbox, and realized that they were running inside of a VM2 sandbox, which is a popular Node.js sandboxing library, which, as they stated, has since been discontinued due to multiple, unrelated security flaws. Normally, in Node.js, you can execute shell commands by importing the child process module and using the exec, execsync, or spawn methods. Of course, it isn't going to be this easy, as we are running inside of a restrictive, sandboxed environment. Microsoft implemented a custom require function, which only lets you import a tiny selection of pre-selected, whitelisted modules chosen by Microsoft. Conveniently, JavaScript actually lets you view the source code of any function, simply by calling the .toString method. If we call toString on the custom require function itself, we can view its source code. As we can see here, a quick binary search is done against the whitelist, and only if the requested package is found in the whitelist does it go on to make a call to the original require function. If the requested module is not found in the whitelist, an error is thrown instead. While this may look harmless at first glance, you might have noticed that they are using the underscore dot index of function rather than the native JavaScript array index of method. This is actually quite interesting. The underscore dot index of function that they are using is the function from the underscore module and is not a native JavaScript method. This enables us to do something interesting. Why not simply override the index of function? We can easily access this function within the underscore module and assign a newly defined function in place of the existing implementation. In the Bug Hunter's proof of concept, they simply defined a function that returns the integer 10. Let's see how damaging this can actually be. Turning back to the start, let's see what would happen if we now try to import the child process module to execute shell commands. When the custom require function receives child process as the package name, it will check if it's a whitelisted module. Of course, we know that underscore dot index of is now going to return the integer 10, which will always be greater than zero. This means that this entire segment will always evaluate to false, 
resulting in the entire if statement evaluating to false, skipping over the error condition entirely, leading to importing the requested module without actually checking if it's whitelisted. Once the child process module is successfully imported, we're free to execute whatever shell commands we want on the server. At this point, we're actually running as root inside of the server, which of course has access to the Azure table containing data shared between all of the different tenants. Within 24 hours of being reported, Microsoft patched this. After this patch was issued, the bug hunter was able to find another way to execute shell commands on the server. This time, they focused on trying to abuse a whitelisted module itself, rather than trying to bypass the whitelist enforcement mechanism altogether. Abusing a whitelisted module would actually be quite helpful, as the whitelisted modules run outside of the VM2 sandbox, directly in the root Node.js context. Coincidentally, they found something of note within the underscore module yet again. Within underscore.js, there is a function called template. The premise of this function is quite simple. You just hand it an HTML template in string form, and it returns a function that can be used to dynamically sub values into said template. The function can both interpolate values using the angle bracket percent equal sequence, as well as executing arbitrary JavaScript code with the angle bracket percent sequence. This means that you can hand the template function arbitrary JavaScript code, and it will happily execute it. Of course, this execution happens outside of the VM2 sandbox, as it is the module that executes it, not us directly. The reason why this happens is a little bit technical, but in short, when a module is passed down from the root context to the sandbox, it retains all of its original root context permissions. Knowing this, from within the sandbox, we can simply call the template function and place some JavaScript within the applicable sequence. We can hand it similar code to what was used in Exploit 2, which will successfully import the child process module, since this code will end up running in the root context. Once again, we have achieved the ability to execute shell commands on the server. After being reported, Microsoft was quick to issue another patch. Turning to the fourth and final exploit, we're going to leave all of the whitelisted modules behind and focus on a native, built-in Node.js module called Buffer. In the case that someone wants to allocate a memory buffer, they can use the buffer.alloc method. This will return a memory buffer that is zeroed out. This just means that the data contained within the buffer is set to all zeros. Another method exists that also returns a memory buffer called buffer.alloc unsafe. This method is faster than using alloc since it will not zero out the buffer. Instead, it will simply return a chunk of memory as is. If sensitive data previously resided in the same memory location that alloc unsafe returns, you would be able to read the data that was left behind. If we repeatedly called buffer unsafe within the sandbox, we could essentially fish for sensitive data left behind from the root context. Of course, it's not going to be this easy. The VM2 sandbox purposefully restricts the use of alloc unsafe for this exact reason. Let's see where things go wrong. Rather than explicitly allowing the use of buffer.alloc, they explicitly restrict the use of buffer.alloc unsafe. All of the other methods a part of the buffer module are still allowed to be used. Interestingly, there's a method that is nearly identical to buffer.alloc unsafe called buffer.slowbuffer. It is an old, deprecated method that was unintentionally left in. Many years ago, the newer alloc unsafe method was intended to replace slow buffer as Node.js evolved and its memory handling capabilities became more optimized. Turning back to the exploit, since we are allowed to use slow buffer, which returns non-zeroed memory, we can start fishing for chunks of memory that could contain sensitive information. With some trial and error, the bug hunter was able to access a few JWT secrets for internal Azure identities, Kubernetes API calls, cross-tenant data, and more. After the fourth exploit was submitted to Microsoft, they rolled out multiple dramatic security changes. As the bug hunter noted, they changed the service architecture to run a completely separate Azure container instance per customer, making any potential future sandbox breaches irrelevant. They also changed the sandboxing library from VM2 to isolated VM. It's not uncommon for some of these vulnerabilities to end up hiding in plain sight for years before a bug hunter is able to spot them. 
Being able to spot these vulnerabilities often requires a mix of effective problem-solving skills, pattern recognition abilities, and a strong foundation of key mechanical concepts. Luckily for you, it's easy to stay on top of this thanks to this video's sponsor, Brilliant. With Brilliant, you learn by doing, engaging with thousands of interactive lessons in math, programming, computer science, data science, and AI. Brilliant is a learning platform that is designed to be uniquely effective. They offer lessons that are designed to instill proper principles and teach you fundamentals from the ground up, ensuring you have a strong foundation to build off of. In addition to gaining knowledge, you'll also learn how to apply it to real-world situations, as all of their lessons are filled with hands-on, problem-solving scenarios, designed to build critical thinking skills that will stick with you across different subjects. The best part? You don't need to dedicate hours at a time to learning. Brilliant provides its lessons in manageable, bite-sized pieces that can be done whenever, wherever, helping you build real-world knowledge in just minutes a day. Personally, I replaced a lot of my social media scrolling with Brilliant, and I wouldn't look back. Most recently, I took their course on large language models, which gives you hands-on experience with real language models. You get to explore the impact that training data has on the model's output, and even spend some time learning how to tune an LLM to become better suited towards a specific task. This is increasingly relevant in the age of AI assistance. A robust set of problem-solving skills and a wide breadth of knowledge are often key in being able to spot patterns and piece together solutions in the world of cybersecurity. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash danielbachter or scan the QR code on screen. Or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring the channel. If you're interested in more vulnerability breakdowns, check out these videos and subscribe to the channel for more content. Thanks for watching.